So what's next? Second house too. I was gone for a week vacation and we're staying in a cabin in Tennessee by the river, hanging out. And I got this notebook and started brainstorming ideas for um, Second House 2. You're always tied to your first game in some capacity as a studio. And so I think a, most people that would call themselves Double Fine fans are Psychonauts fans. Oh, that was the first thing. That's the thing that we're most known for. We're going back to it. Awesome. And it's been 10 years, so that's kind of like a momentous occasion to kind of think about it again. team that's still here and <laughs> has survived or thought of anything better to do or have done that and then come back. My gosh, it just doesn't feel like 10 years have gone by already. You know, there's still some vivid memories, you know, making that game. Mostly good memories at this point. But yeah, this I believe was that this did actually start. It, like the original seed was for Psychonauts was like a sequence in Full Throttle. The the story is that I um, making Full Throttle. I really wanted to explore interactive dream sequences. Specifically, I wanted Ben to um, Ben Throttle to take peyote and wander out into the desert and have a vision, and that somehow in the vision there was a secret to knowledge he had in his brain, but he couldn't access. And um, so it was kind of like an interactive peyote trip, but there was a problem at Lucasfilm is much more, you know, it's a family company. Peyote trip was a little bit much. And so I kind of shelved it. And then, but I've always been interested in the idea that there's stuff in our minds that we don't um, know about, like in our unconscious minds, and that if we could just get in there and dig around, we could uncover secrets that are in our own brain. <laughs> Hello, I've entertained myself. I was kind of talking about this idea, and then um, one of the programmers from a team came in the office and was like, hey, tell me about this uh, game idea about going into people's heads, and, and, and um, I was like, no, 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 you don't go into other people's heads, you go into your own head, and, you, and then I was like, wait, that's much better. That's much better. Going into other people's heads is much better. And then there was another time where, uh, I think we were at le a lunch from, with friends from work, and someone said something kind of strange, and another friend just stared at them and said, "What? What color is the sky in your world?" It's <laughs> like, it's like, like you so, you like, what color is the sky in your world? And I just kept thinking about that phrase. Um, yeah, if you could go into someone's world, like, what color is the sky in their world? Eventually, um, when I left the company, and um, I left the company for a couple of reasons. One was just wanting to have control over what I was doing. And when I created, I really wanted to own my own stuff. I'd have to take a risk on starting my own company. Um, I had made like a couple of hundred thousand dollars from Full Throttle. Like it was amazing. I got the first check for a hundred thousand dollars. I was like, what am I like, you know, single person in their twenties, you know, no house or anything. Just like, what am I gonna do with all this money? It just sat in my bank account. And um, which is so funny now, cause I'm, I have a kid and a mortgage, I'm totally poor. Um, but, um, I had that money and I left and I just didn't, you know, that, you know, it wasn't ex as expensive to live here then. So it was just kind of like, um, kind of carefree for a while. It was just, it was just me in my apartment, in my bathrobe, in my flip flops, thinking about um, going into other people's heads. You don't want to hear these stories. Psychonauts, mind reading guys, stuck in an insane asylum, must get out by journeying into other inmates' minds. Look at my handwriting was better than. Psychonauts, maybe the mind reading ability comes from electroshock therapy. It was a lot darker back then. Here's an animation of what looks like a man turning into a reindeer. <laughs> Dogs made out of thorny branches. That didn't get in, but that's kind of cool. Oh, well, maybe it's a summer camp. A summer camp isn't bad. 
If the whole place is bad, who cares if you win? It has to be a good place, a happy place. And they're training you to be in the Psychonauts and you become indoctrinated by the end of the game and everyone claps. So you had that figured out. But someone evil is creeping around at night like the, like the three-toed monster at Bogey Creek and stealing children. He takes your girlfriend. There could even be a sanitarium nearby. Maybe a mad scientist is burrowed underneath from the mental institution. And there's a little drawing. There's a summer camp and there's Lake Oblongata and the moon. And there's a sanitarium and I was imagining a tunnel, which later turned out to be the lungfish which just carry you over. Maybe the kid is troubled by horrible visions because he's reading minds in his sleep. That, that worked out. Hmm. It was a good day, that was a good day. Sometimes in the book you just write out everything, you get everything done. And, um, and then that's when the idea really took off in my head. It was just like, oh man. And he goes into all these different minds and some of the things he doesn't know are in his own head or is he getting interference from other brains and all these metaphors and you start thinking about people who are like, um, have different, uh, different paranoias or fears or mental hangups, what that would look like in their mind. And then just, it's just like one idea after another started coming out. Oh, people I think who might have enough money to uh, invest if we need investors. So they just started, started making lists of like who to start to recruit. Uh, level designers, hired two of those guys. I think I have an, okay, this is, a, this is the first page of us. Brainstorming ideas for the company name. Hella fun, quit co. We're so excited about quitting. Soul patches, we all had soul patches. Double fine. Space. Physical strength is the main criterion for hiring a double fund. Ow! 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 Hey, check me put the shelf in. Ow! A party! <laughs> party! Yeah, party! Officially party! Woo! That was, that was just, that was still a fun time. Like starting your own first company, it's still so crazy. Like you're like looking at the walls, you're like, this is all, this is my company. I started as that person works for me. That's so weird. So what was the experience like being at the original Clara office? <laughs> um, it was, it was, uh, it was interesting. And it also kind of spoke to the area that the studio was in at the time, where it was like this weird underground garage, old shoe factory. <laughs> <laughs> it was very, very cold in the winter, and so we had these space heaters, and when you plug them in, um, the power would completely go out in the entire building. I think at the time, there's definitely some um, difficulties when it comes to just the facilities, right? I mean, you've heard the stories about how if it rained, the, the sewage blocked up. Yeah. And of course, there's these exploding toilets that we used to get when the rain came. The junkie. It's our first dirty needle. Yeah. It's a terrible time when somebody was getting up outside on our big metal garage door, but they were banging up again. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some hazards about it, but it was really good for parties. We would have, um, these are the priorities you have when you're starting a company when you're in your 20s, right? I can't believe we actually could afford a band for this. <laughs> I know. Yo, this guy's rushing the stage. He's going to do a stage dive. You romanticize certain things, like being able to have cool parties and being able to make, I made everyone's desk at first. I mean, there were these cheap Ikea desks, but I stain, hadn't stained them. I let them pick, what color do you want? And like mix the stain. Like, this is really important to our company that I hand make you a, so you feel like I made you, there's your desk. And they were really unstruct, structurally unsound too, so we had to get rid of all of them. Here's Glottis. I like that sound. Safety goggles firmly in place. What's the longest you've ever been on hold at Pac Bell? I, this, I'm not actually filming. Let me ask you it is. Hello, Double Fine. Yeah, but there was a lot of just figuring out how to be a company. I forgot that part. We were starting a new company. So, yeah. like, figuring out how to, like, exist as a business entity. Okay, tell us what that is. Sell it. Sell it, baby. This is the box called X. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's it's the, huge. The yeah, we were just, you know, started out and we were really, really lucky that the Xbox launched right then because 
They, you know, Ed Freeze was running it, and he had this thing about games being more than games can be art. And I was like, that sounds like what I want to do. Ultimately, great games sell, and great games come from people taking the time and really having the passion to make them right. And people can try in the, on the business side to play all these games and shuffle them around and meet different strategic objectives. But the more they do that, the more they're going to hurt themselves in the long term. I really got excited about this announcement, and I was like, how would I ever get it? Uh, attention of Microsoft and get attention get to be able to like pitch them on, on this game. I remember I, went, I was giving me a talk at GDC, my very first talk at any conference, and it was about character design. And after the talk, Ed Freeze comes up, who's running the studio, um, and he comes up, he's like, I really like your talk, I want to talk to you about making games. And I always remember this because then he, um, before he left the party, he came over to the table where I was sitting, and he put this down on the table. He's like, I really, I'm really excited about the stuff that we talked about. And he just left this on the table. Like, this is the table. Let's get the drama. Here's the table. And he's like, I'm really excited about the stuff we talked about. Hope to talk to you again in the future. So uh, we signed a contract with Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And everything went smoothly. We shipped the game, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So after you sign the contract, you're able to bring on more people and get like more equipment. And... Mm -hmm. I feel like you can tell when you meet somebody whether they're just like the kind of person who gets involved in things with their whole person. Like when they when we made Psychonauts, it was not some calculated decision. Like I think this game's gonna be profitable, therefore I'm gonna work. They were just like I'm gonna give everything I have to this game, and you could you could tell that when you when you met them. Back then, I think I was thinking a lot about just cultural fit. You know, like will this person, you know, work out here? And, you know, it's like almost 15 years later for some of those people. So uh, I was at least right 50% of the time. 13 years for Key Chi. Where's Key? Key. Key Chi. 13 years. Well, it says 13 years, but it does mention an outage for about a year. But I would never draw attention to that to make you feel uncomfortable. Otherwise, that would make you tied with another person. But it gave someone else a slight edge. Happy 13 year for real anniversary to Anna Kipnis. <laughs> Holy crap. Well, uh, welcome to the company. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I ever said that before, but welcome to both of you. <laughs> <laughs> and Scott, uh, I only knew Scott a little bit because we both look at, worked at Lucas, but I worked at Lucas Arts and he worked at Lucas Learning. And he was drawing baby Jar Jar and baby Yoda for these Star Wars games. I mean, I, I heard about him. I remember like, um, I knew that he was. I liked his games and stuff, and I, I knew about him. But I was, but I was. I remember that. I remember exactly when I was uh, turned to being super into him. Like where I was like, oh, this guy's a super genius. And it wasn't from his games or anything like that. It was mostly he sent this company-wide email out one time about something he discovered on email, like to do. Like he figured out how to do something. And the way that he wrote it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. It was so funny. Dude. I was like. This guy, like, he's like, he's, he's used the medium of email, like he's mastered it already, you know? Like that's like masterful writing, like just from email writing. So after that, I was like, I love this dude. And I was like, and I was like oh, after that, I just was super obsessed with him. So like, uh, you know, all my friends that were hanging out with him, like we would like, I'd see him around and be like, oh man, that's that guy, he's so funny, man. That email is so funny. Like <laughs> that's what got me, that's what made me a fan, his emails. We more than his games. When Tim first came to me about for for Psychonauts, he was like, it was um, he, when he was pitching me the game and stuff. He was talking a lot about like Rankin Bass, like stop motion stuff, you know, which is already really interesting because you're looking at like those are like you know '50s illustrations that they successfully turned into 3D and stuff like that. So like it was it was really cool to imagine a stop motion like world like that. And I loved how he thought about. Like that, I, like be doing 3D, trying to make it not look like real humans, but make it look like it was little toys and stuff. So that was super attractive. But I know that he hired me because I, uh, to art direct it because he was wanting it to be the style of kind of my paintings at that time. I went to one of his art shows and he had this um, this piece that we have hanging up in the wall now, which is uh, like from a show called Tongue Tied, where there are all these little pictures of people in awkward situations and just looking at that these little doodly drawings of characters, I was like, I've never seen anything like that in a video game. There's never, I've never seen characters like that ever in a video game. Brilliant, excellent, yes. The kid head. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know I couldn't tell. 
Say some arty stuff right now. Tangent. And that was the appeal, it was like kind of an outsider's take on, on art. And I really felt important. it was important to hire people who were not just kind of from the, the mindset of games as they were, but like from the world of fine art or outside of games to bring a really fresh look to it. Because I didn't want them to look, I didn't want Double Fine Games to look like other people's games. Could you please say your name? Hi, I'm Peter Chan. Excellent. Thank you. Could you please state your full name? Peter Chan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but other than that, we were having a lot of fun coming up with brain ideas. You know, just just um, every person you could think of, like what, what color in the sky, what, what color was the sky in the world, we'd ask you like for every person and um, I think things like the theater just came from thinking about that mental state of, of being bipolar and being really, really happy and switching between these two moods. like. How could that be represented in a, a theater that like changes its sets really quickly or flips over? The Milkman Conspiracy was about those, about based on that character. It was really had a lot of conspiracy theories, but it didn't. In the original Inception, it was like, well, his mind will represent that he's caught in a web of conspiracies. So he'll be his street will be his house will be in the center of this spider web of streets, and then Peter Chan drew it as like, wow, it's like all turned on the side, and he's like, what about this instead? And I was like, oh, that's that's a lot cooler. And the programmer was like, no, don't do it. And I was like, tough luck, come on, figure it out, it's fun. And so sometimes the whole concept for the level would come from that. And then we'd take that back and the level designers would go like, what can you do with a world that's twisted around on itself? What can you do with a world that's on a cube? It was just a really exciting collaborative time where everyone was inspiring each other to come up with crazy ideas. Yeah, I mean, once you had, part of it is that you got all of the concept art. You know, you've got, you've got concepts for literally the entire game, more than you can handle. Like, why is this game? This looks so weird and interesting. Like, oh, and everything, like, I don't get what the gameplay is even going to be because, you know, every, every level design looks so outrageously different from the first. I mean, in terms of, they had the, a unified art style, but in terms of the elements that suggest, you know, affordances, like for interaction and things like that, they were so different. And he had some pretty crazy high concept ideas for it that were gonna be really challenging, I think, to pull off. Dude, that seems like a lot of, that seems hard, you know? <laughs> that game seems hard. At first I was like, I don't even know if I, I, I just wasn't thinking I was gonna do it because it just seemed like so much work. So I was like, ah, oh, ugh, it's a lot of worlds to figure out. But then when, when I was on the, on the project, I was like, what the heck? We're actually doing this crazy thing. Okay, we're in it now. <laughs>